So my name is Steve Harris, and uh, it's really uh, an honor, actually, to be here and uh, welcome people to uh, the conference and introduce uh, Kozuke. Uh, it was three years ago we did the first one of these in uh, San Francisco. I think there were 200 people, and uh, just like uh, the Jenkins community itself, this conference has really grown. I think we have... Um, over 400 uh, attendees here today, and uh, from here, the world tour is uh, moving to Berlin and then on to Israel, and uh, uh, we still have sign-ups going on for these other conferences, but uh, uh, I think you know, you're really part of a fantastic, uh, growing, and really uh, great community the, uh, here today. So just a little bit about the logistics to start off with. Obviously, you found your way here, so this is good. Um, we're doing the two tracks today, and so one of them will take place in here. The other will be up the escalators in the uh, City View uh, ballroom. So you've already walked right by there, so you should know where you are. And um, obviously, we have uh, sponsors for the conference um, as you'll walk through up there. We have uh, two tracks going on, so Kosuke okay, will kick things off here. And um, lunch should be obvious where lunch is. Um, we'll break in the afternoon for um, exhibits to give you time to walk around to talk to um, the various of the sponsors. And uh, then back to the sessions again. All the um, video and slides and so on from all the sessions will be online as soon as the little bees can uh, do their magic. Um, one thing about the um, schedule here today, there's actually a uh, typo, there's a mistake in the program. So um, in the afternoon at the 3.30 to 4.15 uh, slot in the amphitheater, remember the build will take place in here, but it's not Andrew Phillips, it's Robert McNulty from Experian. So the, the, the description is correct, it just somehow we had Andrew Phillips in there. Okay. Um, a really big part of being able to do this conference and do it as cheaply as we are doing it here is because of the sponsors. Um, so it would be really great if you can take some time to stop by their booths and talk to them, find out what they do, and so on. It's, uh, it's great to be able to have this kind of commitment to be able to put this, this event on. Uh, one of the things we're doing here at the conference, if you haven't noticed, if you dig into your bag, you'll find we're doing a, a trivia uh, thing. You'll pull out a trivia card in there. It has questions on it that uh, you can go in and uh, get a sticker from each of the sponsors out in the lobby and so on. Uh, turn it in in the afternoon to the registration table and uh, uh, sign up for a chance to uh, get one of uh, two $50 gift cards from Amazon. And uh, just a note on the trivia cards for some printing reason, you might get one of the trivia cards that doesn't have a slot for you to fill your name in on. So hopefully at the registration table they'll warn you, but if you could, you get one of those cards where you see there's, wait a minute, I'm turning this in, I don't have a place to put my name on. Please just fill in your name and company and email address on the card uh, before you turn it in so that, that if you win, we can let you know. <sighs> So uh, just a little bit about CloudBees, because uh, we are one of the sponsors, and our CTO is going to be speaking next here. Uh, we, uh, we are the uh, enterprise company for Jenkins. We have uh, some products that we build on top of the Jenkins Open Source Project uh, to uh, enable you to use Jenkins at large scale, on-premise, or in the cloud, or connecting those those two together, we obviously have a booth out front. We'd love you to stop by and talk to us. We have uh, lots of people using our stuff, actually, because we provide support for it and provide the facilities to do this sort of Jenkins at large scale uh, capability. Uh, so we're very proud of the companies. We probably have many of you here in the audience today uh, who are using, using our products. Um, one of the things that we are also very, very proud of is, I think, 
how we work with the community, work with you and work with the community that really makes Jenkins as great as it is. And um, I, this is something that is sort of baked into CloudBees and the way we operate. And uh, Kosuke, of course, takes uh, a lot of credit for this. And that is that we're very committed as a company to making sure that Jenkins open source project remains the solution for continuous integration and continuous delivery, that the community grows, that the community is engaged and involved in making that very successful and so on, that it has a very full featured, full strength open source project that we then build on top of to provide support, things like high availability and so on. So, for us, it's very important that the community keeps driving the bar higher with Jenkins all the time. So that forces us as a company to drive the bar higher in terms of what we deliver for you. So that's, that's the way we work. And that's, that's very much our philosophy of how we've done this. And one way we do this is we have a set of great people who are contributing to Jenkins, uh, the open source project, a lot of the plugins that you would use Today are contributed by CloudBees people. Uh, there's a Kosuke, we're gonna talk a little bit about him in just a second. A couple people who really regret putting on those bee costumes. <laughs> <laughs> You'll find them. Are you, are you here? Uh, they're here today, so, but I don't think either of them got suckered into wearing a bee costume this time. Uh, some uh, great other, other folks, Nicholas, Nicola Deloof and uh, Stephen Connolly. We're very much a spread out uh, team worldwide, and uh, so say hi to those guys. Here's one of them you will see. Uh, so to put in a plug for uh, Steve Christo, he's going to be doing a uh, session starting at 3.30 in the uh, back bay uh, uh, room, and uh, the theme is to uh, drink beer and write plugins. Not necessarily in that order, uh, so uh, learning how to write plugins is uh, something I think a lot of people want to be able to do because it's about extensibility with Jenkins. And uh, Steve Christo will be uh, up there to uh, show you how to do that and uh, how to drink at the same time. So uh, if you have not signed up for um, the continuous information newsletter, this is a great source of information about Jenkins, what's going on in the community, what's new, and so on comes out roughly a couple times a year. Um, so please sign up, get the newsletter. Uh, you'll, I think it's a good source of information uh, for you. And um, if you don't do this already, you should use something like Meetup to find people who are like you using Jenkins around you. We're obviously doing this uh, world tour here with the Jenkins User Conference, but there are lots of local meetups. People are really interested in what's going on. It's a great thing about Jenkins is lots of people want to share their experience and, uh, and learn from you, too, about what you're doing. And um, in that vein, I hope, you know, as part of the reason you come to a conference like this is to turn around and meet the person next to you, hear what they're doing, introduce yourself, tell the person what you do with Jenkins, uh, find out what they do, Find out how to get a hold of them. They're local with you here, obviously. So please just, just get out there and, uh, and break the ice and uh, meet your fellow uh, community members. But I think above all, please just uh, have fun, enjoy yourself. So before uh, Kosuke gets up here, I wanted to uh, see what I can do to embarrass him, actually. Uh, so a little bit about Kosuke. So I've had a really the great pleasure of uh, working with him for uh, a number of years now. He sits about 20 feet from me. Most Actually, he, sits, he likes to sit on the opposite side of the room. He sits the engineering side, and then there's like the product side. So he wants to make sure I, I stay as far away from him as possible. So I thought I'd tell you a little bit about him. Uh, something, you know, if you don't know about him, he has a few interesting hobbies. So uh, one of his hobbies, he's really into Lego. And uh, if you have not seen this uh, Lego Earth, it's about this big. And he has a, a write-up about it, about how it was built. And of course, in being Kosuke, he's shared his code because he had to write a program to take the digitized information and transform it into instructions to build the Lego sphere, which uh, he also 
uh, brings his daughter into. And the next project that uh, he and a few other people that he suckered into it are working on is the Matterhorn. So they have a drone uh, survey of the Matterhorn that they've, uh, they have a program that they've now spit out the directions so they can all collaborate on building a Lego version of the Matterhorn. So if you're interested in that, this is another uh, one of his hobbies, too. And uh, it's, for me, it's kind of an unusual hobby, but he does cross-stitch also. He likes to do with his daughter. And uh, <laughs> you're here. <laughs> one, of the, you know, one of the most interesting things about doing cross-stitch is Kosuke is is also into optimization at all times. So when you go to lunch with him, you don't go this way and this way, you cut across and so on. But, but so one of the things about when he does cross stitch is he's, he really wants to understand how he can minimize the use of threads, much like it's a common theme with Jenkins too. And, uh, but one of the most difficult problems he has with this is that the intersection between people who do cross stitch and the people who are interested in programming techniques for optimizing thread minimization is very small. So if you're one of those, you should seek him out uh, today. So, And then, of course, this is his uh, passion and his obsession, so I'm, uh, I'm really happy to introduce him here today. And uh, <laughs> I'll turn it over to him. So let's see. So if you can switch to the projector too, I think that would be great. Or should I just switch this? Oh, OK, so yeah, no, it's working. Um, all right, so OK, so I think let's get started. Well, first of all, um, it's really a great pleasure to see so many of you here today. You know, I understand that you're busy and your time is precious. So I really wanted to thank you for being here today and then you know, sharing your time with us. Um, it's really, you know, thanks to people in the community like you guys that makes this event possible. Um, and also, you know, the part of this throwing a conference comes down to hard cold cash. And then so I appreciate our sponsors for pointing up this money so that we could all hear gathering and talking. And in particular, uh, some of the sponsors actually, you know, not the vendors, but the users of the Jenkins. And, uh, you know, we've started seeing this trend in a few conferences back, so extra shout out for, uh, you know, people in uh, Choose Digital and Ken Show for being a part of the event, for just being a user. I really appreciate that. So Jenkins has been growing sort of, you know, quite tremendously. Uh, the, from the last year about this time, the number of masters that we track around the world has grown about 30%. Um, and at the same time, the number of the saves that's connected to these instances has grown 43% year over year. And then the number of the jobs that these Jenkins would you know, handle, they have grown more than 67% year over year. So not only Jenkins is spreading in more places, but each deployed Jenkins is getting bigger and bigger. And uh, I assume they are doing more and more sophisticated things as the demand for the automation is getting more serious. The uh, company called JRebel, actually the Rebel Labs, I guess, uh, they did a survey, I think mainly to the Java developers, and in their survey they discovered that the, of the people who are doing continuous integration, the 70% of the users are using Jenkins. And it's safe to say this is by far the most adapted CI server on the market. So perhaps of the reflection of this fact, nowadays you can hardly go to any conferences without hearing the name Jenkins mentioned a few times. So if you've been to uh, AWS reInvent in Las Vegas, and I missed this part in Las Vegas, uh, you'd have heard from the guy from Amazon um, working on the Jenkins in the context of OpsWorks. If you watch the uh, Google Cloud Platform Live event, um, I was, uh, or if you're lucky enough to go to the event, you'd have seen the Jenkins appear on their demo, which is actually really unusual for Google to show anything that they're doing internally, right? Everything they do is kind of hidden behind the Google canonical UI, and you don't really get to see what's going on behind the scene. But here is our Mr. Jenkins sort of actually showing up in the demo and then uh, detecting the 
problems in the, in the build that the guy was doing. And then there's the Jenkins appears also on their slide as well. So that's, I felt like a quite an accomplishment. And uh, if you see the, the 1,000, uh, like 1,400 people have seen Jenkins on live in the YouTube. How is that? <laughs> that's quite awesome, isn't it? Um, and uh, if you've been to DockerCon, so Docker is all the rage nowadays. This was happened just yes, uh, last week, I think. Um, you would have seen the Jenkins on their keynote from, I think, the non-technical guy, actually. And at the same level as GitHub, all right, so there's my like 150 million here. Um, and then we even appeared on TV shows. So I don't know how this exactly happened. Like, you know, somebody told me over the Twitter that I don't actually watch HBO, but um, if you subscribe to HBO, there's a show called Silicon Valley. Um, and in one of the episodes, I believe the protagonist had to, you know, work on the, the fixing code. I think the, the database is broken or whatever. And then here it is the Mr. Jenkins you know, verifying that the, the last change is OK. So this is, I think, is like a 3 in the morning, and everyone is tired. But we got to ship this code, and then next minute you see the test will pass, and everything is green. And they would high five, and the show would all end, basically. So that was, <laughs> that was an amazing show. And I, so if anyone, any one of you knows anyone who works for HBO, I really have to sort of buy beer for the guy who made it happen. And they even wrote the plugin that this animation happens in, you know, in this same cut. So I, got a, I, I was very tempted to write this plugin just for the purpose of getting some laugh out of it, but um, I didn't manage. So um, the Jenkins community, I think, um, in many ways, it's a little bit of like a bazaar. It's a you know, vibrant bazaar where there's a lots of small alleyways everywhere, and then you know, there are various people are doing, selling all sorts of crazy stuff, some a little bit shady some not very so well organized. And you know, nothing is particularly clean, but at the same time, there is this incredible sort of the, um, the atmosphere of things that's happening. And then sort of you could sort of walk into any one of the places and you see interesting things happening all, that, all around. So um, what I wanted to do today is to sort of maybe act a little bit as a your tour guide into this crazy bazaar that's happening uh, in the community and then show you some of the interesting work that has been done by various people. So that's, uh, that's my plan here. So the first one I wanted to talk about, and uh, well, Skype is never a good idea, sorry about that. Um, so the, uh, the, the first one that I wanted to talk about is the uh, project called .ci, and this one is done mainly by the guy from Groupon. So, um, this is actually implemented as a plugin, but I'm almost tempted to say it's like a, another flavor or the, another distribution of Jenkins. Um, so it comes with a very opinionated um, the setup for a particular use case of Jenkins. So it's very deeply focused on people using Jenkins with the GitHub or GitHub Enterprise. And it comes with preconceived notion that you're going to only get one job for one repository on the GitHub. And instead, you get to store the, the build configuration in the .ci.yaml file. And then you know, they come with a great UI that you can just click a button once, and it automatically looks up this file, and then you know, configure the job. So it's highly opinionated. But for, if you fit this target use case, this would be a great, great tool. Um, and it comes with the, you know, the Docker integration. So apparently, the group on deploys in Docker container. So if you are using Docker to deploy this, it sort of automates the point of the like, part of creating images and deploying them. Or you can make sure that your build is running on the uh, clean Docker container every time you do it. And last but not least, um, say instead of storing XML files in a uh, file system, as you know Jenkins does, uh, this plugin actually stores the same XML files in the MongoDB. And uh, you know, this is something I, I've been meaning to talk to the guy, but uh, so apparently, they, my understanding of it is that they are doing this to improve the scalability. And I've, been hard, I've, I've heard from the guy that they are running like more than uh, three silent jobs on the single Jenkins instance by using this scheme. So um, oop, there is a, there's going to be an office hour dedicated for this, uh, this functionality in the uh, few weeks from now. So if you're interested in this kind of you know, integration, what, uh, uh, what the uh, Groupon is doing in this space, I'd, be, I'd encourage you to join that uh, uh, office hours. All right, so the next one that I wanted to talk about is the, this one is called the plugin called Dooney. So this is a part of the bigger effort to 
sort of you know, refresh the user interface, shake things up a little bit. Um, so, and that has, you know, that's got a lot of interest. So I wanted to show a little bit about what this would look like. So the Dooney, oop, maybe this connection is not very stable. Oh, oof, oof, okay, what happened? Oh, sorry, no, it's, it's my fault. The screen several kicking in. Um, so uh, what this does, it's, it's basically just a style sheet and a little bit of JavaScript to make Jenkins a little bit more accessible. So it might not be very obvious if you, since the resolution of the screen is kind of different from what you're normally seeing. But uh, you know, he made all these thing, clickable targets a lot bigger. Um, and then um, you can also see the uh, build history. Um, I'm sorry, the console output that's in the black on uh, uh, white on black, and so on. So there's a number of these, these smaller changes, or in addition to, um, yeah, I guess like a CSS-based animations. So this guy, I guess many people in the community felt that this guy clearly knows what he's talking about, and then we are trying to bring some of these functionality back uh, into the, oops, into the core Jenkins in coming releases. So, um, this is being currently worked on uh, Kevin Burke, which is the, um, I, I forgot, I think he's living in uh, San Francisco, but I've never met him in person. And then Tom Fennelly, uh, he's the Irish guy. Um, and then so they are sort of working on, as a first step of UI refreshment, um, so they are working on bringing in all the CSS improvements and various JavaScript changes into the core. Um, and there's a related effort going on to finally get rid of the table-based layout into the DAB layout, based layout. So bring the, some of the layout in, into the 21st century, finally, after 10 years or so. Um, and uh, the, you know, generally make the UX a little bit better. So uh, if you're interested in this kind of space, that Kevin has written sort of like a attack plan on how to go about these changes. Um, and then uh, we are doing this in a way that pay respect to the compatibility. So you might be interested in dropping by uh, on the dev list to get the sense of the, this mega thread that's happening. You know, there's a conversation that has more than 60 emails on this topic, so it's a quite an active area. And then if this first round of change will be well received, and some of the changes has actually already landed in the core, so you can expect a release in maybe a couple of weeks from now, um, is that the, uh, so we are gonna be, be spending a lot more time in trying to sort of provide the dynamic content update after the page is loaded. So one of the common, I think the uh, pain point in Jenkins is that if you're looking at the dashboard, it doesn't really change, so you kind of have to reload the page all the time, which adds uh, to, the, uh, to the load. Um, so there was an earlier meetup of the Jenkins developer in the Europe, Europe called FOSTEM UI, and the FOSTEM Jenkins developer meetup, and this was one of the topics that's left over from that as well. So there's a lot of things in this space that's currently being discussed, and not just beyond just the UI changes, we're trying to improve more substantial UX changes, like you know, helping people create jobs more easily, uh, or providing the bundle of the plugins to help people find them, that sort of thing. And as a part of this effort, um, because for us to provide any modern asynchronous post page load updates of the content, we kind of have to rely on a newer feature in Sublet. So we are thinking about bumping up the minimum requirement from Sublet 2.5 to the Sublet 3.0. And according to our usage statistics that we looked at, there's about two to three percent of the user base who will be impacted. In other words, they would have to upgrade your Tomcat 6. Um, so, so far, the feedback from the community of doing this has been pretty good, so I think we are going to do this at some point in the near future. But if you have a good argument against that, like if you are under the tyranny of your IT ops that somehow cannot upgrade the Tomcat 6, like maybe WebSphere shop, I don't know, um, then you know, come talk to us afterward and then maybe uh, we'll, we'll think about that. Okay. So uh, keeping on uh, this theme of like, you know, point technologies, there's another thing I wanted to talk about, which is this uh, chef and puppet integration. So I think many of you are sort of expanding your domain of automation, so now you probably don't not only just do the build and test execution, but in many places it's used to feed into the configuration management tool at the runtime that actually deploys the application to the servers for the purpose of you know, 
staging environment for running tests and for the production environments. So as we see more people doing these kind of things, uh, we started feeling that, okay, there's like a currently big gap between what these tools do, like, you know, Chef and Puppet does versus what Jenkins does, and they aren't really talking to each other. So we needed, we thought we should be able to fix this. And Jenkins has this technology called fingerprint, uh, which is just, it's quite suitable for this purpose. So I wanted to, you know, create a little integration in this space. So this is the, basically how this feature came into being. The idea is that in places that's using both the configuration management tool and Jenkins, you probably start with, you know, some kind of source code repository to do the build, and then it goes through Jenkins and then basically turned into some kind of binary. Um, and then so that binary, so let's say if you're a Java shop, this binary might be like a WAR file or a JAR file. Maybe it's a Debian package, maybe it's a Ruby gem, whatever they are. It's basically in the end, it comes down to a bunch of files. So what fingerprint is, is basically a MD5 checksum of the files. So MD5 is not good for cryptography, but it's still good enough to produce a very unique small number of digits for every unique files. So what Jenkins does is as it converts the source tree into your binary file, it records the checksum, the fingerprint of the file, and then it ties that back into the commit ID that came from it. So this binary, once it's created, it normally goes to somewhere else outside Jenkins. You might be using something like Artifactory to store these binary artifacts. Uh, you might be using S3 to upload this file into you know, locations. Um, and then eventually the ops teams would take over. They got the uh, amount of servers that's running Chef or Puppet, and these tools, they run their on their own schedule by driven by the operations team. And then what they do is eventually they pull down these files that the developer has produced and then start running them on the target machine. So what happens is that, okay, there's, all, there's uh, so many ways to have these files stored in some other places and so many different ways to deploy these files in place but at the end of the day, if you could sort of get a little insight into what the chef and puppet is doing, we could ask them to provide the same fingerprint, the same checksum information of these files. And then if it, that information can be then passed back into Jenkins, then we could really figure out, the Jenkins could now learn uh, that the which file, like, you know, now that Jenkins could tell that the build 157 is deployed on server XYZ on the 12.55 uh, p.m. Pacific time uh, at, the, at the pass called Etsy, uh, know, or whatever that is. So that's the idea. Um, and then so now Jenkins could see, get the insight into where our files are being deployed, which version of the build it came from, you know, what, what it was running before, and that those sort of things. And then we could even, Jenkins could then use that information to automate some bigger, even bigger stuff. So I'll be actually talking a lot more about this later today, so I probably shouldn't go too much into it. But, um, you know, this, I think, is sort of, as more and more people start into uh, the continuous delivery that spans bigger automation cycle, I think this gets pretty useful. The, another consideration in doing this feature is to minimize the impact into your configuration management. So it turns out that in case of Chef, there's only like you only need to add the three lines of additional configuration in the Chef recipe to basically install a custom report handler. In case of Puppet, Puppet already it turns out that they already produce MD5 checksum of everything. So their built-in report handler would just work with Jenkins, and then so there's. You just have to add like two more command line options to use this feature. So it's really easy. Your operations people do not really have to know that you're using Jenkins and you still could benefit from this. Um, or I guess if your operations people, your developer don't really have to know that you're using Jenkins and it could still work on it. So it's a, I think it's a great way to make this work. Um, the only parts that I'm really looking for the real feedback from people using Chef and Puppet in various contexts is that the, right now, this, the path in which this change comes back to Jenkins is somewhat simplistic. Whereas in most places, I'd imagine, the servers do not have direct access to the Jenkins, which if you're running this inside corporate firewall. So we got, uh, I think we got to do some work in this space, but um, you know, so that's one of the areas that I'd love to hear back from you. All right, so more, and, and there's just, 
OK, there's so many these, like a, what I call as a point integration with specific tool. And I could talk about this forever. But the, let, let me just talk about one last thing in this space, which is the Jenkins and Docker integrations. So you know, as the uh, interest in Docker is primarily driven developers, and these people know how to write Jenkins plugins. So there's a lot of interesting Docker-related plugins inside the community nowadays done by multiple people. So .ci, I already covered that a little bit. There's like a, you know, it comes with a whole uh, integrated Docker support built in. But there's also an other plugins that help you do with Docker-related things. That's a more general purpose. So the, one, the second one is done by the My, Nigel Magni. He's an interesting guy. That, like, he normally doesn't work on Jenkins, but whenever he comes back to Jenkins, he does some crazy awesome plugin, and then he moves on to something else later. So you kind of have to pick up where he lives and try to carry the flag forward. But what this plugin does is basically um, it lets you run Jenkins slaves inside a Docker container so that your build always starts in a clean, isolated environment and it gets shut down at the end. Um, and then the Michael Neal, uh, who lives in uh, Australia, wrote uh, another plugin that helps you build the Docker image and publish the result uh, into the Docker uh, hub. So again, if you're doing the Docker container as a unit of deployment, this would make simplify like a credential handling and actual pushing of the images, and it provides some nice UI integration. So um, there's a, you know, you're in the good, so you, you should look at these plugins if you're interested in doing Docker-related things from Jenkins. So there are a number of these, like a, you know, the integration with individual functionality in this DevOps space, but what I'm really actually excited about talking today is something that ties all these things together. You know, um, it's, it's what I call as the workflow, and this is something we've been spending a lot of time on lately. So, um, the you know, in places that you're doing, in most places that sort of is going beyond just the build and test execution, I think it's pretty common to see a setup like that where, so this is actually a, uh, from the article that Andrew Phillips and I wrote uh, some time ago on InfoQ. And then, you know, here we are talking about the typical continuous delivery pipeline that might, it's not toy. So, you know, we have some things that needs to run in parallel for performance reasons. You know, we, gotta wanna, we wanna run the functional test before we spend the time on the regression test and the you know, long running performance test because those things will be well uh, slower. And this pipeline tends to span across multiple teams, and it could also involve like having the final step of the deployment predicated on the business approving the deployment. So as a developer, we're gonna you know, make the build ready to deploy all the time, but it's up to somebody to actually finally press the button and do the deployment. So you know, I think it's this kind of setup, I think is very commonly seen in many places. Now, the standard way that the people do this today is basically by mapping these individual steps, these little blocks, these individual step into their own job. And then you, you use perhaps like, you know, the handful of plugins and combine them in ways that they do the right thing. So you often, you end up with something like this. And on one hand, I think it's great that all this, like, you know, if you, if you wanted to build whatever continuous delivery pipeline, whether you're working on the, uh, the Ruby apps or Java apps or the, uh, the hardware design or whatever, um, so you got it, whether you want um, the uh, airplane or the tractor or the car, you know, we have all the building blocks necessary for you to assemble anything you want. So it sort of provides great flexibility, but at the same time, um, it's sort of, if, you, if the only thing you want to get is a, a car that runs, then the fact that you have to just think about how to assemble these pieces into one coherent shape could be a burden. So we started thinking, um, and actually the community started thinking a long time ago that we should do something about this problem uh, before the people really start deploying the complicated uh, pipeline they set up on Jenkins. So um, this was one of the most lively topic that was discussed in the scalability summit that happened in California last year. And so we've been finally, you know, started implementing this feature. So, uh, in, and we are calling that a workflow. So the, the first thing that the workflow does is basically it lets you define the, that entire pipeline, the whole picture, 
in just one job. And then so you could now be, you know, do everything inside this single job. And what that means is, say you got the uh, you know, 50 different product lines that's supposed to follow the similar pipeline, or well, you could just deploy them very easily. It's so much easier than copying dozen projects per job. It's a whole lot more scalable and all that. And next, uh, you'll be doing this in the texture form, not just by clicking and pointing around. Um, and then not only if you, well, if you've been using a plugin called BuildFlow, um, that's actually a very popular plugin that was quite instrumental. It's a great input into this effort. You've seen that these plugins uh, do this thing in the, do the same choreography, do the same orchestration in the text. Um, so we are sort of basically following that. So you don't have to, so uh, when you do this in the text, well, you can look at the disk, you could put these things into version control system, and you could generally manage change a lot more carefully. So I think this goes in the uh, spirit of the configuration as a code very well. And um, in case this is not very obvious, well, this is probably not very obvious, but uh, you can, you, you're basically writing your work so as a program that runs from the beginning to the end with some help of these constructs that let you run multiple steps in parallel. So um, we discovered through various other plugins that currently exist today that this approach seems to be very popular. So we are taking this. Um, and since this is like an entirely new functionality, uh, the subsystem on Jenkins, we're actually taking this opportunity to fix lots of other long-standing issues that's very difficult to address uh, in the existing job types. So the first one that I wanted to mention was this issue of wrong running builds. So, you know, how many of you have tests that say, like, runs longer than two hours? Right, okay, so that's probably common. Like, how about more than six hours? <laughs> all right, okay, wow, all right. So let's say, like, um, the three, more than three days? Okay. Oh, yeah. See, so I once used to have the, and I used to work for Sun. So we had this test that the Java EE compatibility test that needs to run for like six days, and you know, so these things, um, and so while that might be a little bit too extreme for people who are running a test that spend more than a few hours, I think you know the pain of having builds going up in the in the part way. And then like, you suddenly lose the connection with the slave, or that you have to restart Jenkins, and everything that happened in the build would be lost, and you have to start over again. So this is no longer the case with the workflow. We are fixing that. So you could, while you're, you're running like, you know, this three-day long test, you can shut down Jenkins, install new plugins, bring it back up, and Jenkins would still know that you are running these slaves, running these tests on these slaves, and they'd be able to reconnect things back. So, um, now, now there is no more like, a need to burn the midnight oil waiting for the right time to restart Jenkins because you can now do this any time, right? Um, yes, another thing that, uh, another functionality that we are baking into the workflow is this notion of retroliability. So we've been talking to lots of like, uh, people who are doing this workflow kind of things and we discover that a lot of complexity into their workflow comes from the fact that the, you know, they are, they are afraid that any one of these steps might fail at any time. So, you know, as the workload progressed, these steps would complete one by one, and imagine that each one taking a couple of hours to run. And unfortunately, at some point, let's say, because the server was done or some, for some silly reason, like say disk space is out, you know, whenever this long running thing fails, it's always for some silly reasons, right? Um, and when that happens, well, it's kind of, it's a, it's, you're in the tough spot. Well, what you do not want to do is to just go all the way back to the beginning and restart everything from scratch, throwing away everything that has been done before. That would be a tremendous setback. So what instead we let you do is you can now define a checkpoint um, and then at, at some an arbitrary point in the workflow. And then whenever you define a checkpoint, you can go back to the checkpoint as opposed to go back, go all the way back to the top and then re-execute the workflow from that point. So there's a, this little bit of magical features happens in, um, from like some pretty deep engineering inside Groovy. So that's one of the, the things that uh, we put in this to make the workflow substantially easier. So you don't have to bake in this retry code inside your logic. You could just let it fail and then restart from the, the nearest checkpoint. So how is that? Um, 
So in a way, so you know, the one of the messages that I'm trying to get across is to previously, you know, to organize something like this, you, you really have to put together a lot of things in the correct way. Um, but now, so we had, with workflow, we are trying to create this one plugin that bind them all. It's like you know, one plugin to rule them all is the idea. Um, so you know, the I think I think we got the, so this is still a very early effort, but I think we got a lot of things going. Um, and uh, the, uh, the plugin is obviously like open source, um, so you can go look at what you do. Um, there's a whole bunch of extension points that allows us a plugin to build on top of workflow, which is obviously in the DNA of the Jenkins project. And for a moment, let me put my CloudBees hat on, and you can expect some value ads in the future from CloudBees uh, Jenkins Enterprise by CloudBees. And then uh, Jesse and I have been spending some quality time on this in the, in the past few months. Um, and uh, so he's going to be doing another talk right after this to go a lot more details into this. So I, I highly encourage you to check out. And uh, how am I doing time? I think it's OK. So all right, so that's the work. So, um, um, and uh, now moving on to the another part, which is the quality improvement in Jenkins. So, I guess this is something, um, first, actually, first of all, so we are changing the way the, the LTS releases are produced. So LTS stands for long-term support release. So these are basically like a sustaining releases of, of uh, a certain mainline release. So the, the way it works is it's a 12-week uh, cycle process. And then for, for every uh, four weeks, we produce one sustaining release, and then we repeat that process three times. And then once we get to like, you know, something, something, one dot something dot three, the community would pick up another baseline and then move on and then to, to the next sustaining release. So we've been actually doing this for some time now. But uh, so far, we've been shipping these uh, LTS releases when we felt we are ready. Uh, and uh, you know, we've been, now, but now that we are doing this for like, um, I think a year, a little over a year now, um, we started b gaining more confidence in the way the process would work out. So we are now sort of finally switching the model to the train model, meaning you have a lot more predictable schedules as to how we are producing LTS. If you go to Jenkins calendar, if you go to the Jenkins main website, you can see the calendar, and there is all the future release plans listed in there. So among other things, what we are hoping to achieve here is as a large scale user, so like I see, you know, as a serious user of Jenkins, you can now plan ahead your upgrades in coordination with our release schedules. In some places, people run some preliminary upgrade testing. And you know, if you're doing that, you might as well do that while we are testing the bits so that any bugs that you discover, we could fix at the same time. Right? So that's one of the motivations. Um, and then from the community's point of view, that would create the bigger opportunity for us to work with the broader user base. So there's a more eyeballs that's working on this LTS bit. And then that, so we, we hope that uh, that would discover, help us discover more issues before we declare them released. And then so that way, everyone gets to enjoy the higher quality code. So that's the idea. So if you are, you know, if you're one of these companies who do this, uh, uh, who do this, uh, the pre-upgrade pre testing, I highly encourage you to try to work with us to make sure that, you know, uh, that your, your changes you need, your, the fixes you need, is in place. And we already started seeing with some users that they are doing that, and I see some of them here uh, in this room, so that's great. Um, but uh, we, can, we can have more of you. So in relation to this effort, uh, we are sort of reviving this old project called uh, Selenium Test. So um, I think this February, earlier this year, Vivek and I, uh, started porting over this original acceptance test, which was written in Ruby, by, started by another guy in the community uh, called Tyler, uh, into the Java. And then so we are sort of, you know, given that the, the, most of the Jenkins code is in Java, this, makes it, this made it very easy for the rest of the community to hack onto this acceptance test. And so since then, we are starting a lot of activity in this plugin, I mean, in this acceptance test and its harness. So today, um, on average, we have more than 50 commits coming in every week, providing, you know, making the harness better or writing tests. And so far, we have about the, uh, more than 20 people uh, push the, uh, the changes into our repositories. 
So they cover, all in all, they cover about the 50 of the most popular plugins, ranging from LDAP plugin to Git plugin to whatever that uh, else, like a Findbox plugin, let's say. Um, and then they have the uh, more than 350 tests between those to make sure that the major functionality of Jenkins is working fine. So the way the acceptance test works is basically it's like a, it's a black box testing. So you know, we start Jenkins in some environment with some sets of plugins. So you should be mentally picturing that, okay, you want to test the Jenkins that you run with the plugins and version that you're using and then tested use Selenium to interact with Jenkins over its you know, standard uh, HTTP layer, and then um, it makes sure that the desired side effect did happen. So you know, what we might try is, okay, all right, so let's create a new slave, and let's run the git build, git build job on the slave, and then to make sure that it can check out from the git repository, that kind of stuff, okay? So, so in this space, it's a fairly general purpose harness. But in this kind of setup, we can, for example, find uh, the browser-specific issues by trying different browsers. You know, historically, the IE always tends to be a problem because none of the developers really use that. Uh, we can find the, we, can, we are hoping to find more container-specific issues, like the JBoss and Tomcat certainly behave somewhat differently. Uh, or the operating system-specific issues where we do have a number of native code uh, in various parts, isolated parts, and then these things sometimes break. Um, or the packaging specific issues, they actually test the Debian package or the RPMs that we are shipping. So all these testing that otherwise it would have been difficult to do on the existing unit test integration, right? basically integration test harnesses that we have today. So now what from so those are, the, I guess, the benefits for the developers. They ask in the community, I mean, the, those of us in the community who actually hack on Jenkins. But for you, the users, one of the points that I wanted to get across is that this is actually something you should be interested in, too. So I mentioned that the test involves running, launching Jenkins in some environment with some set of plugins, right? So what I'd like you to be mentally picturing here um, is that now you could actually run, there's a substantial control that we have. Maybe I got too excited here. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, um, the, uh, what was I saying? Uh, yes, yes, so the, uh, yeah, so now as a, run, as, a, as a runner of the, as a guy who ran the test, you have a substantial control over how this tested launch Jenkins in what, in what environment. So you could actually test your, the, the exact same production setup or that with the exact same set of plugins and you can run the test cases on top of it and make sure that they are run fine. So you know, it, I think it simplifies some of your testing part. Um, and also, because now you can write these tests, if you're actually doing any kind of testing before upgrade, you could automate some of that by writing tests on top of the same harness. And then that means the rest of us in the community could run these tests. So not only can you automate some of the tests that you do, you could actually push up these changes into the community and make it a part of our release criteria. Right? So it's kind of awesome that your test is sort of, the Jenkins release is contingent on your test to make sure that in your environment, Jenkins is run fine. So we are trying to create the bigger pool of the test in this way and then um, to be able to sort of cover functionality in various spaces. So, you know, there's a lot of interesting kind of tests that the people want to do. Uh, and then so this acceptance test harness actually consists of a number of the separately reusable pieces. So, um, you know, some of these, for example, are, can be used on its own. So, for example, I mentioned about the Selenium. So there's an extensive set of page objects that let you interact with Jenkins UI. But if you're, let's say, trying to do some kind of long-running testing, you might not be very interested in using Selenium at all. But those people might still find, let's say, the Docker fixtures useful. So for example, with this part of the harness, you, we, could, we are launching, let's say, like an LDAP server, the real LDAP server that is configured in certain way to make sure that the test case would work correctly. Uh, we got another fixture, for example, that run, launches the address in Jira so that their Jira plugin could correctly update the bug ticket whenever the commit message mentioned that. So there's all sorts of interesting high-level testing that can be done by using this that you might find useful even if you don't find some other things useful. So similarly, we have a cucumber integration for people who are not 
interested in Java, uh, or you have a ways of getting a large number of machines from EC2 or OpenStack or wherever else to be able to sort of you know, run the broader the scalability test. Um, so we are trying to expand. So far, the main test that most of the tests that's been written focuses on functional tests, but um, the effort is in progress to actually, uh, effort is in progress to expand this into some of the non-functional tests, like uh, you know, the long-term scalability, uh, the, the load testing, that sort of stuff. So there's a good, I think we, we, start, we are starting to see a, a good number of tests that's a mass here. So um, the one though that I think the, the challenge is going forward is we need to actually find places to run all sorts of interesting configurations all the time, continuously, which is kind of what our tool is all about. So, um, but that takes some more machines and set up and some, some time resources. So, you know, this is one area that I'd love to see more community participation. You know, if you're running Jenkins on CentOS, well, I think it's in your interest that the Jenkins community has infrastructure to run this test on CentOS. So we, we you know, be very happy to see this effort done. Um, and then there's some more test stability improvement of this test uh, that needs to happen for us to really start being able to look at the failure more seriously. Okay, so on that point, so I'm, I touched on a little bit about the scalability, so I wanted to sort of in, like drill down a little bit in there. So uh, we've turned, we've coined this term X1K, that stands for like a one, like a ex execu one thousand executor, the idea being, all right, so if you go from, say, like a 20 executor to all the way to, say, 1,000 executors, all right, so what does it take for us to be able to, to, be able to comfortably recommend people connecting 1,000 executors on single Jenkins instance? Some people do that today, but it's definitely like an outlier. So we are trying to sort of think in terms of where we could improve. So this is an effort that's going on for some time now. But um, the, the, in the latest round of this effort, so one of the improvements we've done is to introduce the NIO in the remoting. So this is, a, I guess, a relatively lower level technology in Java that allows more efficient IO. And then so more, more specifically, we could use a fixed number of threads, like you know, a few of those, to manage hundreds or probably even thousands of the slaves. Um, and then so we've, uh, so in the, uh, the version that we released this Monday contains the solid implementation for that for the JNLP slaves. So if you're using like a, the slave, Java web start slaves, then when you upgrade to new version, this will kick in. And we haven't really measured this very carefully yet, but uh, according to some other tests that we've done in the similar vein, we discovered that this would really improve the uh, snappiness of the Jenkins master. So it, you know, it, it sort of simplifies, it reduces the burden of managing slaves and then more time and more resources could be spent on actually uh, you know, managing the uh, user interfaces and so on. So it makes things a lot better. And then we're gonna, if this is successful, we're gonna deploy that to the CLI connections soon. So you, that should see the performance gain as well. And in the similar problem space, uh, I finally sat down and spent some quality time with the, the issues in the Maven 2 job type, and in particular, the uh, slow artifact archiving performance. So I guess one of the benefits of being able to work with the large scale users through cloud is, is that I get to sort of really see all this complicated environment that ma magnifies the problem. Um, so, and then, so we were finally able to fix this uh, artifact archiving performance substantially. I think this happened maybe uh, two months ago or so. So um, if you've noticed that this was slow, then I highly encourage you to upgrade to our newer version. And there are more improvements in the Java Web Store slaves. So one is that um, the way the Java Web Store slave works uh, is that the um, you'd, well, once it starts, and it basically, that slave process keeps on running, and every time it loses a connection with the master, it keeps trying to reestablish the connection. But in any case, so the master might be restarting for whatever reason, like plugging updates and so on. But uh, the slave process is being around. And as we, so this makes it very easy for whatever simple bug in plugin or some such issues to slowly clog up the slave VM 
eventually like you know, leaking something and eventually make it unresponsive. And so we suspect that that has contributed to part of the instability of this kind of slaves as we see that as a common issue. So, and eventually, you're right, the slave would die, and, uh, choke and die. So, uh, in recent version, we started doing the Jenkins slave restart more proactively. So, whenever it loses connection with master, well, you know, because it lost the connection, the next time it starts up, it has to do everything from fresh. So, might as well restart the entire JVM to start in a clean state. And so, that's what we do uh, for every unique slave that's connected to a JNP slave. And also, if you have installed JNP slave as a Windows service, then the Jenkins would actually talk to the Windows service controller to get the slave restarted automatically. So this kind of thing, I think, would not only help. So between this uh, scalability improvement and here, I think the uh, usage of the, uh, the general use, usability of the JNP slave hopefully would have improved um, considerably. OK, and uh, so the last bit that I wanted to cover is on the infrastructure of Jenkins. So actually, the, so this is, uh, the, this has, so we started thinking that, okay, so, you know, the, um, we, let's, let me try again. So I think we, we started deploying, actually, uh, Jenkins itself to manage our own infrastructure. So the Tyler, who is the, the primary guy for managing our infrastructure, he felt that um, so the current way of us using Puppet to manage, uh, manage the, our infrastructure is not particularly working very well. So he enlisted the help from the Puppet Lab and really redone the whole thing and created the top-notch uh, continuous delivery pipeline that involves Jenkins and uh, Puppet and Docker. So we are now building individual services into the Docker images and building those on Jenkins and they get deployed. Um, so it's kind of a really a model set up for, I think, I think what we think as a model set up for people doing something similar. Um, and uh, actually, the, and, and the, another great thing about, another motivation for us doing this is that the, I think the, there's a lot of interest in the community to see what it looks like to put the whole thing together and how it works. So people are looking for the use cases and white paper kind of thing that showed them how these things, how these things can be put together and made to work together. So the great thing about Jenkins project is that this is an open source project. So you can actually go to this repository and see everything in gory details about how we do this. So you could replicate this setup entirely on your own or you can use this as a starting point to build your own uh, build your own the uh, continuous delivery uh, pipeline that use, involves Docker and Puppet. And um, so also this would you know, expose us, the Jenkins developers, into the integration with Puppet and Chef and then you know, the Docker and so on. So I think we get to learn a lot about where we can improve to make our integration better. And I think all in all, that's a net positive thing. So, uh, this effort is you know, very much underway, um, but uh, we are kind of short-staffed, and then, so we'd love to see uh, people join this effort as well. You know? um, I think in many enterprises, because there are so many existing staff that you need to keep going, you cannot really make a drastic change and then sort of go to all the cutting-edge stuff. Right? Whereas in the open source project, I think there are so the legacy inheritance is actually a lot smaller. So there's a great opportunity to innovate here. And then, you know, the, another good thing about it is that the, the result, if you work on this effort, your result is all out there. So when you think about uh, going to another company, you could point to this, what you've done in the Jenkins project. And, uh, and then that's, I think it's good for your career. That's certainly how I have been changing jobs. Look, I got, I got this open source project that uh, has been kind of useful here. So I think I'd certainly encourage you to you know, join us in this effort. And you know, this doesn't involve any Java knowledge at all. So I think it should be useful for other kinds of people. So um, that's sort of like the kind of theme here. Um, so um, I, I sort of went through various topics quickly to give you some hint as to what's cooking. Um, there's a lot of other efforts that's going on. In fact, like, I, I don't claim to, uh, to, to know every effort going on in the project. It's kind of big and diverse, and everyone wants to do their own little thing that they like. So it's a kind of messy but quite vibrant place where a lot of things, exciting things are going on. And I hope 
I get the, uh, I, I hope you, you got some of the things that we are working on from my talk. Um, and then I guess the last thing I wanted to emphasize that you know, all these efforts is mainly sort of done in the community by people from all around the world in the true open source style. And um, you know, we derived much of our strengths from this, having this very active community in which we engage, and then there are interesting ideas that come into being. So you know, I think you know, this, it, there, is this, um, there is this unique joy in working in an open source project, and I've been spending a lot of time in open source for the past several years, and I could really tell you that sort of it's something deeply satisfying about seeing p users using your stuff, and you know, that you, what, what you've done is actually helping other people, and you get personally appreciated for what you do. So, you know, we should, i really looking forward to work with more of you in this project to do more interesting stuff. There's all sorts of things we could do. So let's build this effort together, and in the rest of today, you'll be hearing from the some of the other people who are doing lots of interesting things. So, you know, go talk to these people and then try to see if you can, you know, build something on top of what they've done, right? So that's it for basically my talk. Thank you very much.